hearty, hearty thank you for those who showed up for our red meeting. Now, I kind of almost expected a low attendance because we put it out like this. Hey, this meeting is for those who are currently volunteering somewhere. That didn't mean, I mean, it didn't make no difference if you put a flag up outside or if you help put the tent up or empty the trash. Whatever you do, if you volunteer or if you intend to start volunteering. And I thought, you know, when you start talking like that, you might or you might not get a good group of people. But we had uh, well over 100 right here in the sanctuary and 40 plus or more on the backside. So I give the Lord praise for that <clears throat> because that's people that says, I want to put my hand to the plow. Last Sunday's message, do you remember what it was? Someone else, that was the last myth, someone else will do it. And many, I had so many requests for that message. I want to encourage you to go to YouTube, type in the Harbor Worship Center, and our YouTube channel will come up there, subscribe to it to start with, and that way you get notifications every time we post a message, which is every Sunday and Wednesday. And if you're on the road or whatever, you can check it out. And uh, by the way, that is a convenience for you. Uh, it's not an excuse to stay home, but it's, um, it sure does... Uh, uh, meet the need when you have to be away, and I'm so grateful for it. Today is a, a different message, and we call it a standalone. It's um, where uh, we're not in the midst of a series and, and not promoting a series right now. But I, let me just say to you, we've got some powerful things coming up um, in the month of December. I'm really, really looking forward to it, and I just believe with all my heart we're going to break some records in December. I am privy to an uh, to an awesome kids drama that we've been working on now, I imagine about two months, and probably got the earliest start ever uh, for the kids crew, and we're going to have a, an awesome time on the 20th. And, and, but prior to that, we got some things going down for the adults as well that's going to happen right here on this stage. It's just going to be incredible. So I'm excited about the month of December and I'm excited about what God is going to do. And of course, Thanksgiving being this Thursday, I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm looking forward to my grandson Nolan coming. How many of y'all will agree with me? He'll come tomorrow on my birthday. <laughs> Amen. I'm believing that. So uh, he's due on Thanksgiving, but uh, I was born on Thanksgiving, so that could work. But Jordan don't want that. Uh, so let's, let's get him here tomorrow. What a tremendous birthday present that would be. Amen. Anyway, let me talk with you today about the thought, thankful Christians. Um, here's what we absolutely need to know. I want you, and this sounds so simplistic, you would say, now, Pastor, you didn't have to tell me that. I know that. Everybody knows that. But here it is. You've got to understand, in order to be a thankful Christian, you've got to understand that God is faithful. God is faithful, so we ought to be thankful. I didn't know what Tara was going to talk about as she uh, began to talk about the book Proving God this morning by Al Taylor, which I read a number 20 plus years ago, and I had forgotten about the cotton farmers, but there again we see a faithful God, so we ought to be a thankful people. Amen. I am thankful personally for a God that always works it out. No matter how bad it looks, Sean, I have seen times when I looked in that mirror too and said, man, I am wrecked if God don't show up. I am thankful for a God that when I've done something stupid, and like Macaulay Culkin said in Home Alone, and sometimes, ma'am, I do get into mischief. Y'all remember that? I know I'm dating myself a little bit here, but nonetheless, the Christmas season will be right here on us. And sometimes we do get ourselves in fixes, and most of the time, it's our own doing. And yet, God loves us enough if we will re confess it and repent and ask Him to forgive us. He'll say, all right, look into the mirror of my word and see if you can do better. Amen. So I'm thankful for a God that works it out even when I've messed it up. Hello? Amen. I've, I've, I've asked God way back over the years to help me with some things, and I'd keep messing it up. How many of you ever got your bills all where you needed them to be? Because you, you don't want to mess them up to start with, and you ask God, Oh, God, if you'll help me, I'm going to get this thing right, and I'm going to be 
faithful to you. And I'm going to tie next thing you know, you got 14 credit cards and they're all at the top. Are you with me? Oh, Lord, help me work out this mess. And he said, I didn't start that mess. But he'll help you if you'll be faithful. He'll take what little you got and he'll help you again. Listen, things don't always look like they're going to work out. But here's what the promise of the Lord is. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Let me help you out. Some of y'all didn't catch that one, so here I'm going to go, I'm going to go again. In all of thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You say, Pastor, you made that up. No, one of them was in Psalms 37 and 23. The latter was in Proverbs 3 and 6. And then he tells us in the New Testament, for some of those that have to have that, Romans 8 says, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and the Catch this. Everybody wants to stop right there and say, well, all things work together. But everybody loves God and half the world loves God, they say. Now, they can't tell you which one they love. But I'm going to tell you what Bible says. The Bible says there is none but him. There is only one. Amen. There are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Give him praise. But... He says, we know all things work together for the good of them that love God. Here we go. And are the called according to his purpose. So what I'm saying is this. is when we are doing our dead level best, we are acknowledging God. We are faithful to God. He says our steps are ordered. I'm going to tell you, I've done some boneheaded things in my life. And I look back over my life, and I see where I've done something so stupid, and God reached down and said, I'm going to be merciful. And I'm going to pull you right back over here. I'm, I, I know you blundered right there, and you really messed it up like a knucklehead. You got out of line, but I'm going to pull you back onto the path. Are you? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a faithful God that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but go with you all the way, even unto the end. Friends that put their arms around me, that hugged my neck and said, I'll stay with you no matter what, are gone. I'm looking right into the camera. They're gone. And they've been gone a long time. But he has never left me. And he has never forsaken me. Amen. People that said they'd be there are not, but he has. I want to tell you something. God is faithful to me. Let me tell you a little story. This is, is my personal life. I come down here um, 20 years ago in August. I lived in the old parsonage there for two and a half years. And then I had this idea that I've got to get uh, I, in my mind. I said, I've got to get my wife out of here, we've got to get into a better situation, and, and my kids and whatever, it's small, it's cramped, it's, uh, it's damp and musty and all those things. But yet I was thankful to God. I lived there two and a half years. I said, Lord, please help me. And, you know, and it was really rough, and the church wasn't strong enough, you know, hardly to do a housing allotment. So I, I, I did get a housing allotment of $300, and I took on rent of $750. Y'all with me? Say amen. Y'all been there? And that's bad if, you hard, if it's hard times already and you ain't paying $750. See, none, I'm going to talk to myself because ain't none of y'all listening now. Ain't none of y'all been there. But nonetheless, I, I went on this way. And I had an opportunity to buy a house. And, and it was out on Ridge Road. And I made a deal and signed the contract. And I optioned to buy it within a year. And the year went by. And I had my finance and just about right. And it didn't pan out. And I needed about 30 more days. And I had a verbal agreement with this individual, and somebody offered him two or three thousand dollars more than he sold, said he'd sell me the house for. So he says, "Well, I'm going to sell the house." I said, "Well, that wasn't our agreement. Well, it is what it is." And, and you know, so nonetheless, he, I'm going to show you how God works it out. I'm telling you, the wind was knocked out of my sail. I felt like a failure as a husband that I wasn't quite providing like I needed to provide for my family, my wife, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And listen to me, I'd already left the three-bedroom brick home back in Valdosta before I went to Claxton for five years for the ministry sake. Seven months old to leave it and say goodbye to go live in a shack. And lived in that to 18 months until God provided a nice Brand new, double wide trailer, 1,700 square feet, brand we laid it all out. And so I come here, I said, Lord, I'm taking another step backwards here. But God, every time I took a step backwards, God catapulted me forwards. Are you hearing me? I had a lady in the church that 
bought me a mailbox thinking that I was going to buy the house just like I thought and everybody else thought out on Ridge. And she took this mailbox and painted something beautiful on it, had my last name on it, and had 242. That was the address. And on both sides, it was real pretty. And then the deal went south. I mean, it went bust. And I said, well, there it is, you know. And I prayed and I believed God. And I thought it was God's will. And lo and behold, now it's gone. Within the month, I had a lady told me, said, I'll sell you my house. I said, well, oh, yeah, where do you live? Well, in Creekwood. I went down there, looked at it, loved the house. It appraised for eighty-five, eighty-seven thousand dollars or so. She said, "I'll sell it to you for seventy-five thousand dollars." I said, "Oh, really? Yeah." My wife liked it. She liked it. I said, oh, well, praise God, seventy-five thousand dollars. Y'all know what the address was? Two forty-two <laughs> Creekwood Drive. Now you tell me. I'm not a mathematician, Dr. Strong, but y'all help me out. Something with three digits, 242. I don't know what the possibilities to be, but there's a whole lot of them. The, the chances that it would fall on the exact same address number. Only my God. I'm a thankful Christian because I serve a faithful God. God says, I'll work it out somehow. I well, always we had time to explore that a little bit, but I better go on. He's a faithful God. Let me say this. He was faithful to Abraham when he told him to sacrifice his son Isaac. He provided a ram in the thicket. He was faithful to Joseph, who was separated from his family for 20 years. And he spent all that time in the pit and in the, in the prison. God eventually put him in the palace. And then I think about Israel, who was for 430 years... Uh, in slavery down in Egypt, but God was faithful. And, and the Bible says that he heard the cry of the people. And guess what? Amram and Jochebed conceived a baby. He, he was a boy, Hebrew boy, and they named him Moses. His name means drawn out. He would be pulled out of the Nile River by the Pharaoh's daughter. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Because Pharaoh had commanded that all Hebrew boys be thrown into the river for execution to kill them. Him. But God had other plans. God had other plans for Israel. So let me say this to you, friends. When you think you've got it bad, God still got his hand in the situation. I think about Paul, who spent a third of his life in prison, and it seemed bad for him, but you know what he did? He wrote a third of the Bible. Amen? I think about the prophet's widow who was about to lose her son because her husband owed some money. And, and Elisha told them what to do. And God turned it around. And they lived the rest of their days on the money from the oil that they sold. I think about Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord when God was going to kill every living creature or mankind, that is. I think about Lot that God says to Abraham, I'm going down to Sodom and Gomorrah and see if it's as evil as has been reported to me. And I'm going to rain fire and burning sulfur and brimstone upon them. And guess what? God spared uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot. So why is it that you need to understand that God is faithful? Therefore, we ought to be thankful. Listen, when you know in your mind that God is faithful, it will give you the courage to be thankful when things look bleak. When you know that God is faithful... It'll give you the courage to be thankful. Look at your neighbor and say, when you know that God is faithful. It'll give you the courage to be thankful. I'll bet you that some of you could look back over your life and remember a time when God worked something out in your life when you didn't know what you was going to do. I bet you there's been a time where you just thought, man, I am in deep water right here. I bet there's been times when you had to lean on him, when you could not see clearly, and, uh, and you just had to keep pressing on. You know what that's called? Living by faith. It's called walking with your hand in his hand. Without a doubt, there's been times when you thought, if God don't show up, I am in trouble. See, trusting God when things go bad. Trusting God when the bank says no. Trusting God when your friends walk out. Trusting him to know that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but go with you all the way to the end. Well, let me give you an example. I think of a fellow by the name of Job. 
I wish I had time to tell you. But Job was the richest man in all of the East. He had all these things worked out. God had blessed him. He was a rich man. He had affluence. He had luxury. He had ten children. He had all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, in a moment, I mean in a day's time, it all went away and it was gone. He, in fact, his body was stricken with, you know, after that, after he lost all of his wealth, his cattle, his, all that, his body was stricken with bulls, and he sat in uh, sackcloth and ash, and he scraped himself with a piece of pottery. And, uh, you know, his wife said, why don't you just go ahead and curse God and then die? In other words, she believed if he cursed God that God would kill him. And he responds to her and says, shall we take the good things from the hand of God and not the bad? Huh? Don't y'all know that it rains on the just and the unjust? Huh? Don't you know when it rains we all get wet? Sinner and saint alike. Don't you know when the storms come, they come to all of us? And he looked at his wife and said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In other words, I've got such a relationship with him. If it's over in this life and I move on, I'll see him on the other side. For he knows the way that I have taken. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. And at that last day, even though the skin worms devour this flesh, yet in my, or this body yet in my flesh, shall I see God and not another. He was convinced that this is temporary. That, that, that I'm going one day to the place that he's prepared for me. Man, so when you know that he's faithful, it'll give you the courage to be thankful. Now, here's what I want you to do. I gave you an illustration from my life. I gave you an illustration from Job's life. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to trust him in the darkest hour of your soul. Y'all hear how quiet it is? You know why? It's easy to say, Pastor, God's got that financial miracle working out in your favor. Don't worry about it. Huh? It's easy when someone else says, your kid's going to be all right. They're going to be healed and filled and all that's good. Don't worry about it. When you're standing on the top of the bungee tower and they say, just go, man, the rope's got you. It's all right. As long as we're down on the ground and it's somebody else up there. I got plenty of faith for you, bro. It's good, man. Parachute's going to open. But when it's you, when it's your house almost in repossession, when they're coming to get your car, y'all hear me? Maybe something stupid that you've done or whatever, and you fall on your knees before God and your face before God, here's what I want to tell you. Trust God in your darkest hour. Listen, and even though it may not turn out the way you would have it to turn out, He is still God. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. He is still God, and He'll still move, and He'll still work. I, I think about this, see, because we live in a world where we want to see proof. We want a contract. We want God to sign it. He said to Thomas, Because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who've never seen me, yet they have believed. In the darkest hour, I think about, it comes out of Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. It must have been a dark hour for a young father. I want you to hear the story. He said that when his disciples came to him, there was a great multitude around him. And the scribes were disputing with him. And immediately when they saw him, all of the people were greatly amazed. And they're running to him and greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? One of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, I know if you check this out, it says he's demon possessed. He said whenever it seizes him, he said, it'll throw him down, and he'll foam at the mouth and gnash with his teeth, and he becomes rigid. But I spoke to your disciples that they could cast him out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, generation, or faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to him, and when he had saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. This demon that was inside this young boy, as soon as he come up with Jesus, he just right, he, he just decided to show out. Y'all ever seen any demon show out? Come on now, I have. Yes, sir. I, I'm down in Barranquilla, Colombia, and I watched a 16-year-old girl kick the leg clean off of a chair. 
I'm talking about clean off of it. When guys my size and uh, several other guys my size, 200 plus pounds, are, are, are praying and trying to hold down this wild, demonic child. I watched her eyes as wild as uh, you've ever seen. I saw her bite her own tongue and lip till she bled from her mouth. And finally, when we said, be free in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, when that demon left her body, let me tell you, she went limp as a dish rag. Her eyes looked like puppy dog eyes. She reached up with both hands and embraced us and said, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to be free. I wanted to love God. I wanted what you got, but whatever was in me wouldn't let me. Oh, I know that's scaring some of y'all to death, man. I done checked in the wrong place this morning. Oh, Lord, what have I got myself in? You visiting the first time I know, man, when he's off his rock. <laughs> Let me tell you something. For the next several nights, we preached in the, 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 the soccer fields in Columbia. She was there for every service we preached. We preached in nine churches. She was with us till we left there. God delivered her miraculously from demon possession. Are y'all hearing me say Amen. But let me go on with my story, the Bible story. They brought him to him, and the spirit convulsed him. He fell to the ground. He wallowed. He foamed at the mouth. Same kind of stuff we were seeing. So he asked the father, how long has this been happening? And he said, from childhood. And often it has thrown him into the fire. What did Satan come to do? To steal, to kill and to destroy. He said, this spirit has often thrown him into the fire. And... Um, he said, uh, and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, watch this, these words right here, and I want to leave these words, man, you've got to get these words right here. He says, if you believe, if you can believe, look at your neighbor and say, if you can believe, all things are Possible to him who believes. Now, let me just say, well, give him praise. Let's just say it's your child or grandchild. And all of a sudden a spirit convulses him and we're out roasting marshmallows and s'mores. And this spirit tosses him over into the fire and we're reaching and grabbing him and trying to pull him out. And the kid wants to get out, but something. You see, here's the difference in being depressed, oppressed. Y'all, let me say, when you're oppressed of the devil, it's like, like if this is you, and the devil comes up and he buffets you. He buffets you. He, 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 he starts pushing you around. That's being oppressed of the devil. To be possessed of the devil, let me show you. If I had a glove right here, that glove represents mankind, you, me. To be possessed of the devil is when Satan literally inserts himself into us and manipulates our body, our hands, when we do his bidding. And that's what had happened. And this boy would run into the lake, the spirit. Let me give you, I know some of y'all want proof. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When Jesus cast a demon out of one called Legion, you know what he did? He, he allowed the demons to go into the hogs, into the swine. What did they do? They ran downhill and drowned in the lake, in the sea. Why? The devil has come to kill and steal and destroy. So this demon would grab him and try to drown him, try to burn him. He said, but if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out, what's this, with tears. Immediately the father cried out with tears. I, I want you to see this. Lord, I believe. Say that with me. Help my unbelief. Sounds like a paradox, don't it? How is it you believe or you don't? I know things are cut and dry like you're either pregnant or you're not. Hello? You're either white or you're black, or, but even that now. Right? But Jesus said, I mean, this guy says, Lord, I believe. The Father says, Lord, I do believe you. You said if you can believe, all things are possible. He said, I believe. But would you help the part of me that's having trouble believing? Now, I don't know about you, but I've knelt on the side of my bed sometime and in the office and said, Lord, with everything in me, you know I believe you. 
tears streaming down my face. God, I take your word. I'll die for your word. I believe, but there's still this nagging in me that says, help what part of me ain't wanting to believe it. I hope I ain't the only one. (laughs) John the Baptist was in prison. He had held the Messiah in his hands. Jesus, he held him in his hands. Jesus said, baptize me, John. He said, no, 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 no. I need to be baptized. He said, no, no, suffer it to be so. And Jesus was baptized. But John took him, dipped him in the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He come up, heaven open. God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. There's God in heaven. There's the Son on the earth. And then a Holy Spirit comes lighting upon his shoulder because the Word had been, it is he that I light upon. That is him. John had looked and saw him coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But now, he's in the last week of his life, and he's in prison. And he sends his disciples and says, Go ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah? Or should we look for someone else? A man that held the Son of God in his hands and baptized him, saw his daddy on the throne, saw the Holy Spirit descend, but yet he's in prison and said, Lord, I've preached it. I believe it. Everything in me says it's true, but just go ask him, is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? And I'm going to tell you something. If somebody like John the Baptist and Jesus said, no greater is there than John the Baptist. If somebody like John the Baptist could say, Lord, I believe, but help unbelief maybe it's not the end of the world that you and I have had a doubt run through our mind every now and then and we got to fall back and say Lord please help me I want you to know this it didn't save John the Baptist's life he still lost his head but he's in the kingdom of God today are y'all with me give him praise We have to trust Him. I'm going to tell you, how how can I do this? How can I trust Him? Because He's got a record of being faithful. He's got a record of being faithful. I've got a grandmother that never drove a car a day in her life. A devout Methodist that loved God more than life itself. Shut herself up into a prayer closet. I mean, come out drenched as I am every day of her life. Called every name of her children, every grandchild, every great-grandchild, until Alzheimer's took her memory and she couldn't do it anymore. Laid hands on me and prayed that I would be the grandson that would carry the gospel. Happened to be I'm the only one out of all the ones that... Let me tell you something... She's on the other side. And when I finished preaching this gospel and I've stood for hundreds and preached their final farewell service, the celebration of life, I tell you, on the other side, they are waiting on me there. Amen? And tomorrow, my 49th birthday just reminds me that I'm getting one step closer every day I'm going to enjoy this life while I'm here don't get me wrong but I'm going to tell you there's more to this life than what's on this side I want to be a thankful Christian while I'm here you know why because he is indeed faithful to me even when things look horribly bad and wrong he's got a record let me show you this Job said, I go and look forward, and he's not there. I look backwards, but I can't perceive him. I look where he works on my left hand, and I cannot behold him. When I turn to my right hand, I cannot see him there. But he knows the way that I take. When he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. I want to tell you, he's a faithful God. I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to close. The first councilman in the Bible's name was Stephen. And uh, they took him outside the city and they stoned him to death. Paul, who, or his name was Saul of Tarsus at the time, he was standing there, I believe this is Acts chapter 8, and he stood there and he watched the clothes of the people that killed him. And there they, they took him outside the city and they stoned him to death. 
Saul was a learned man. He knew about Jesus. He knew about all this stuff. Well, they stoned Stephen, and as he lay dying, I mean, how many, you know, you can only take so many of those big rocks hitting you, and finally he crumples down. And as he's laying there dying, the Bible said the crowd looked on him and saw what they thought was the face of an angel. Now, he was not an angel. And by the way, when you die, you don't turn into an angel. That's another story. I'll, I'll talk about that one day, but I hate to bust your bubble, but he looked like an angel. But the Bible says he quoted what Jesus quoted, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And when he said that, heaven opened up. And you know what Jesus had promised us? Jesus had said, it's expedient that I go, go away. It's necessary because if I don't go away and go back to the Father, I cannot send you the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter. And guess what? You know where Jesus left from? The right hand of the Father. If the Father is seated right here, now this is a poor representation of a throne, but if the Father's right here, His Son was at His right hand. And the Bible says that when heaven opened up, there stood Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. That Jesus would just, how many of y'all know we play our national anthem? We'll say, when everyone please rise. And here's this martyr of the church, this faithful councilman. And Jesus stood up as heaven opened. And he looked and he saw the Lord, proof positive that Jesus was not still in a grave somewhere that he had not been stolen away and hidden by some disciple somewhere but he had indeed ascended back to the father and it is true what the angel said this same jesus you've seen go in like manner will come again stand with me Whew. ushers i'm going to ask you if you'll get ready to uh, serve the people in just a moment church i, I believe more than anything in my life at this time we've got to be a thankful people we've got to be thankful and it's not enough just to say it we've got to live it a life of thanksgiving I'm going to tell you something our words are cheap for the most part it's how we live it's what we do Jesus says you know we'll know people by what they do and the fruits they bear. I am thankful. He is indeed faithful. Not one thing he has said to us in this book is going to fall, but every bit of it is going to come to pass. Just as he said, can we pray together? Father, we just come to you now. So thankful. So thankful, Lord, for what you've done. So thankful, Lord, for your touch and your mercy.